Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Bible study tonight. We bless your name for how you always teach us by your spirit, opening the pages of the scriptures to us, so that our lives will please you and will walk in this narrow way that leads to heaven. We pray, Lord, Lord, today that as we study the word, you help us to understand it in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that you keep us awake and keep us at alert so that everything your spirit will be teaching and instructing us on will receive it in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, that with the word will come the grace and the power to become doers of the word in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. We continue in our study of the scriptures. We're now in First Peter chapter 2. The apostle had been talking about the believers. These believers were living in a hostile environment. But then he wanted them to understand that the environment they were living in will not be an excuse not to live the Christian life they ought to live. And like every faithful minister of the gospel, Peter the apostle was concerned about not just about the sound doctrine they ought to believe, but about the Christian life that the believers ought to live. He was concerned about practical Christian living, just as he was concerned about the sound doctrine of the word of God that he taught them. He wanted them to know that there is an undeniable evidence when we truly believe the word of God, and that will be that we are living in conformity with that word that we are learning. And in the verses we're looking at today, Peter is instructing the believers, the believers of that time and the believers of our time, that we have responsibilities. And he actually deals with three areas. Number one, we're sojourners here on the earth. And then he tells us what our attitude ought to be. Then number two, as citizens of a nation. And as citizens of a nation, he tells us what our duties and responsibilities should be. And then number three, as servants working under some employers or some masters. As sojourners, as citizens, as servants working in a place. And he speaks about the spiritual life, the inner life of the believer. His submission to constituted authority in society. And his service as endeavors to earn his living in a legitimate way. Look at First Peter chapter 2, reading from verse 11. It says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly laws which war against the soul, having your conversation, your character, your manner of life, honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evil doers, they may by your good works which they, will, which they shall behold glorify God in the day of visitation. That's the first part. That's talking about we are strangers as sojourners here on earth. He moves on to the second part, which talks about uh, the, the attitude and the character of the believers in a civil society. Submit yourselves, he says, to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evil doers and for the praise of them that do well. For it is, for so it is the will of God, that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. In verse 17, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. And now he comes to the third part, which is uh, what the servants ought to be. How the employees ought to relate and react in their places of work. Servants, he said, be subject to your masters with all fear, all honor, respect. Not only to the good and gentle, but also to the forward. For this is thankworthy. If a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully, for what glory is it? He was talking to believers. If when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently. But if as believers, when ye do well, and you still suffer for it, you take it patiently. He said, this is acceptable in the sight of the Lord. Those are the things we're looking at today. If uh, people around us are to believe the gospel, if they are to be drawn to the Lord, we ought to share that gospel, shine that gospel, and relate with those uh, people around us that they will know that the grace of God is truly in our lives. Actually, one unbelieving writer of the past generation wrote, he said, 
show me your redeemed life and then i might be inclined to believe in your redeemer what he was saying is i like to believe in your redeemer i like to know that jesus christ is lord and savior but you say you are saved show me the proof of it the evidence of it the good in it and then i will see the good it has done in your life i might be inclined then to give my life to the lord Sinners are not reading the Bible, but they know our lives, they are reading our lives. If our lives will show and reveal and manifest the gospel to them very clearly, without anything standing between them and the gospel as they see our lives, then they will be drawn to the Lord, they will be drawn to receive genuine salvation. That's the essence of what we're looking at today, the importance of what we're looking at today. Three points we're going to emphasize. Number one, our separation and spirituality to glorify God. We're strangers here on earth, we're sojourners here on earth. We need to be separated from the world and then live a life that is distinct and different. And then show that we're spiritual, a spirituality, a spirituality which will bring glory unto the Lord. The second point is our subjection and submission to the government. We live in a civil society and we need to be law abiding there ought to be subjection and submission and then the people walking around seeing our lives assault on the earth and light in the world will be able to see there is something that makes a difference in our lives and grace and christ make the difference then number three is a servant's service as unto the lord wherever we're walking to earn our legitimate uh, living then we'll be able to show that we really belong to the Lord by the life we live. And even our employee, employers and co-workers will be able to testify that he is different. And because of the difference they see in our lives, they'll be drawn to glorify the Lord in the day of visitation. We're looking at it point by point. Number one, our separation and spirituality uh, to glorify God. I read once again in First Peter chapter 2. Verses 11 and 12. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. How are we to behave? How are we to live in the life we're living now, having your conversation? Honest among Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evil doers, they may by your good works which they shall behold glorify God in the day of visitation he addressed the believers as strangers and pilgrims he says dearly beloved i'm addressing and beseeching you pleading with you that you you will live as strangers and pilgrims on the earth actually he even started like that look at chapter 1 verse 1 peter an apostle of jesus christ to strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. He wrote to them right at the beginning. He said, I'm recognizing the fact that this is not your permanent home. I'm recognizing the fact that you're on a journey. That this world, the life in which we live, is just like a journey. We're moving from here to there. And therefore, the people around us, they may not always understand how we live and what we do. But please understand, you are belo the beloved of the Lord. Washed in the blood of the Lamb. Transformed by the grace of God. Prepared for another kingdom. And you are being prepared for that heavenly city where you are living here now. You are just a sojourner. You are just a stranger you are just a pilgrim show then by the way you live that this is not your permanent home there is a hope in you that you are going to another place in chapter 1 verse 17 it says and if ye call on the father who without respect of persons judges according to every man's work hear this now pass the time of your sojourning here in fear in honor in reverence in respect for the lord that you will obey the word of god understanding there is a lord above your life understanding there is master there is a controller controlling your life understanding your citizenship is in heaven there is another law a higher law that is guiding you and as you are living here in this world as a stranger and as a sojourner you are passing the time of your sojourning here in fear reverence honor obedience to the word of god who is your master your savior your lord and your shepherd and you're living in this world showing all the other people you cannot do what they are doing because this is their own home this is the best place they will ever be but the best is yet to come for you therefore you are living as a person that is expecting his lord that will come and take you home on the final day some 119 some 119 reading from verse 19 it says i am a stranger in the earth 
hide not thy commandments from me. He says, I need the higher law that will guide me in the life in which I'm living now. Because the laws of the earth are so limited for the pilgrims to heaven. The laws of the earth are so limited for the people that have their home in heaven. Oh Lord, you remember that I'm a stranger here in the earth. This is not really my home. I am a foreigner here. And I want you to show me your way and your will and your word. Hide not your commandments away from me. And then in that same psalm, verse 54, it says, Thy statutes have been my song in the house of this my pilgrimage. It says I'm on pilgrimage here. It says I'm a journey, I mean, I'm, I'm journeying on here. And because of that, uh, it's your law, it's your word, it's your statute that has actually been uh, my comfort as well as uh, the one that is directing me. We are partakers of the riches of the glory of God. And because of that, we are pilgrims here on earth. We are sons of the King of Heaven. And because we are sons of the King of Heaven, we are strangers here on earth. And we as foreigners here on earth, our heart, our affection should be centered on our eternal home. It means that we understand every day as you wake up, every night as you are going to sleep, that you don't have any permanent home here. You're only a sojourner here. You are traveling to a better place, eternal home, there in heaven. And because of that, you will not be so attached to the things here on earth. You actually, you actually hold the things of this world with a loose end because uh, your eyes are fixed on something greater, something that is more precious than what we can see now. If you come back to First Peter chapter 2, First Peter chapter 2, reading there from verse 11, after emphasizing the fact that we're strangers and pilgrims here, then he tells us something. He says, abstain from fleshly laws which war against the soul. He's saying that the journey may not be all smooth. He's saying that it may be tough and rough. You know why he said that? He said that because, uh, you know, in this world, as you are journeying unto heaven, temptations will come. Trials will come. The pleasures of the flesh will try to draw you back. And the things that the people of the world are doing, and the things you see, they'll try to draw you back. It says, understand. In fact, he now uses another language. It's using the language of warfare. It says, you're a pilgrim here, and the citizens of earth, not knowing, not understanding your intention, your purpose, your desire, your passion, wanting to be in another home, they're going to fight against your spiritual life. And they're going to do that in a way. They'll bring fleshly love. Lost, they'll bring affections of the world, they bring the lust of this world, and it will war against your soul. But he says, You have something to do, you will flee, you will abstain, you will avoid, you will shun everything that will hinder you from getting to heaven, from getting to that beautiful place you've been reading about and dreaming about in Second Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2, reading there in verse 22. It says, flee also youthful laws. That's what Peter was saying. And that's what Paul here is saying. He's saying that on this pilgrimage, uh, you ought to understand there are dangers on the way. You ought to understand there are temptations and trials in the way. You ought to understand there are some things that will try to beat you back and caution you and, and draw you back and drive you back and make you not to be able to make the goal. It says, therefore, you have a fight to fight. It says, therefore, you have something to resist. It says, therefore, you have something to flee from. It says, therefore, you have something to abstain from. And except you are doing those things, they appear negative. Abstain and flee and avoid and shun and run away from and flee from. Except you are doing those things, you will not be able to make it uh, to, uh, to your final home. There will be an accident on the way. There will be uh, a backsliding, a kind of backsliding in the way. If you don't realize there is a fight to fight, if you don't realize that you are warring against something and that your flesh and the world and the demons and Satan will try to hinder you in getting to that place. That's why it says, flee. Also youthful laws are young uh, people as they are growing up in their teenage age years. They begin to realize that uh, the flesh was not uh, a kind of a friendly servant they thought their flesh was. They begin to feel in their body a kind of attraction drawing towards the opposite sex. 
and it will almost appear some of them may become so great on them, the girls as well as the boys, as if they should just, you know, get into the things of the world and they let go and just do whatever it is. Uh, then eventually some of them backslide. They get disease. Not only that, they lose salvation. Not only that, relationship between them and God is caught. That's why it says it's very strong among the young people. But it says flee that thing. Close your eyes toward that thing. Shun that thing. Avoid that thing. Flee also youthful laws. And uh, we also discover those of us who are adults that that thing that had been in your body from early childhood, from your youth, drawing you to the opposite uh, sex, as if uh, you should go and commit sin, uh, you discover that in your early 20s and late 30s, uh, the sin has not gone. It's like the devil still wants to use that sin and wants to get at you to commit immorality or fornication or adultery. Even some people that are married, the problem is still there. But it says, remember Joseph, when the wife of Potiphar wanted him to commit sin, he left his garment in the hand of uh, that woman and ran. And sometimes that's the only thing you can do. That you'll run for your dear life, your spiritual life, your eternal life. And the ticket to heaven the Lord has given you so that the devil will not take it away from you. Flee also youthful laws, but follow after righteousness and faith and charity and peace with them that call on the name of the Lord with out of a pure heart. That's what the Lord is telling us. He's saying that if we're going to actually make it on the final day, the works of the flesh, we have to disregard, we have to shun, we have to, and we have to crucify, we have to run away from, so that our lives will be watched. They ought to be in Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. I'm reading there from verse 19. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. Now, the works of the flesh are manifest. What are they? Which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. You see that? Those are the things that war against your soul. As you say, I'm going to climb up. I'm going to make progress. I'm going to get to that heaven. Then on the road, and it's a narrow road at the corner somewhere, and it's a dangerous bend, a dangerous corner. Adultery is waiting, and fornication is waiting, and fornication is ready to fight with you. And he says, I'm going to get your back to the ground. I'm not going to allow you to continue. That thing you call holiness, sanctification, I'm going to get it away from you. Even the rudimentary initial salvation you've got, I'm going to get it out of your heart. And then that adultery begins to fight against you. It may be in your place of work, the secretary. It may be in your place of work, other ladies that are there. It may be in your place of work, some people that are bent on the works of the flesh and they will say you don't need to even pay any money. Yeah, they're not going to charge you anything for it. They want you to get into works of the flesh. It's a fight. And except you really understand, you are strangers and pilgrims here on earth and you want to make it to heaven at all costs. And you know that the kingdom of God suffered violence and the violent take it by force. Except you know that, you're not going to fight against that sin. But those are the things that are warring against your soul and you need to fight against them. And our children who go to school, they get salvation here and then they go to their school and that thing is waiting for them in the school. And the girlfriend and the boyfriend and all the other things that the people of the world are doing. They introduce it to them. Not only introduce it to them, they plead with them they should do it. Not only that, they make fun of them if they didn't do it. Not only that, they will even try to write letters to them and get things across to them. It is when they know it's a fight. That salvation I got when I repented, when I gave my life to the Lord. That salvation I got at the price of the blood of the Lamb that died for me. I'm not going to lose it like Esau lost his birthright because of a mess of pottage. It's when they fight that fight against the works of the flesh. They'll be able to overcome and they, keep, they come back from school and they're still saved. But those of them who don't fight that way, those of them who don't resist the devil and the works of the flesh that way, they get salvation here. They go to school, they lose it over there. By the time they come back, they're like Samson, they've lost their power, they've lost their grace, they lost their eyes, they've lost their eyes, they've lost the light of the gospel they had before. They begin in square one again, crying, save me, save me, save me. Eventually they get it again, and then they go back and the fight is still waiting for them. That's what the word of God is teaching us. That as uh, pilgrims and as strangers here in the world, you have to fight all these works of the flesh in verse 20. It's, it talks of idolatry and witchcraft. 
hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, and heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I've also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That's the reason we're fighting against that thing. That's the reason we have to crucify those things. That's the reason we're running away from them. That's why the word of God says in verse 24, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and the laws. And so you understand then uh, what the life of the believer is supposed to be. Uh, there should be a change of life. Please come back to First Peter. In First Peter, reading from chapter 2 and in verse 12 now, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles. It says, yes, you will still be among the Gentiles, you students, you are schooling among them, and you adults who are trading among them, you are working with them, you are living in the same house with them, but then it says you have your conversation. That's what conversation in the original means. Your character, your conduct, your manner of living, your lifestyle. You have your lifestyle honest among the Gentiles. The word honest there means winsome. It means right. It means good. It means that you live your life in a way that you show. The grace of God is in your life. Having your conversation, having your manner of life, having your character, your conduct, honest, winsome, good, gracious among the Gentiles. That whereas they speak against you as evildoers, you may be surprised no matter how good you are, no matter how saved you are, no matter how righteous and holy you are, there are still some people that will speak against you. You understand that he spoke against Joseph, he was righteous and good. And you understand they spoke against even Moses, he was righteous and good. You understand that Samuel was all right, he spoke against him too. And David in his earlier years when he was following after the Lord, uh, there was somebody that still hated him. And you find Daniel that was righteous and faithful before his God. They still spoke against him. You come to the New Testament, the Lord Jesus Christ, holy and righteous, beloved of the father this is my beloved son in whom i'm well pleased and there was no sin in him holy and pure and perfect could you imagine there were still some people that spoke against him therefore no matter your christian experience you are saved you are sanctified you're filled with the holy ghost who are living the righteous life there are still people that will speak against you that's why it says that whereas they speak against you as evil doers that they may by your good works when they shall behold glorify the a God in the day of visitation. It says, uh, you, you, they will speak against you, but then let your light so shine before men that even though some few people are speaking against you, the people that behold your good works, they will glorify your Father who is in heaven. If that is going to be so, if your life is going to bring glory to the Lord, there is something then that will characterize your life. There is a renewal. There is a regeneration. There is a transformation that has taken place. And in fact, Paul the Apostle tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, reading there from a uh, verse uh, 22 through to verse uh, 24. It tells us that he put up concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful laws, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that he put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. That's the way your life ought to be. In fact, uh, as you look at, uh, at uh, Philippians chapter 4, Philippians chapter 4. Here yeah, it tells us uh, uh, by different uh, areas. Finally, my brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things because the thought generates the action. The action, the habit, and the habit generates the character. Because of that, it says that you will so live your life that you will test everything that you do before you do that thing is it true before you get involved is it honest and before you put your hand in it is it just and before you get involved with anybody any group of people what we're going to do there is it pure is it of good report when other people will hear about it and when the courts of heaven will hear about it will that be a good report in the ears of my heavenly father is it virtuous is it of any praise then you think on those things how did jesus put it in matthew chapter 5 matthew chapter 5 reading from verse 16. 
Matthew chapter 5, reading from verse 16 here are the words of Jesus Christ. He says, let your light so shine. Have you got the light at all? Are you born again? Is Christ the light of the world living in your heart? Has there been a change, a transformation? Or are you just coming to church because we have people that are just coming to church? They come, they hear, and it appears everything just gets off them. It gets in in one ear and comes out the other ear. It comes and they may have some head knowledge. It doesn't affect the heart. It doesn't affect the character. It doesn't affect the conduct. As they were, so are they. And if something dramatic and uh, a really a crisis of an experiment doesn't take place, as they were, so they are today and so they will ever be. And they might find themselves on the other side of the final day. But when you are coming and the grace of God has done something in you and the word of God has penetrated in your very being and the grace of God has transformed and changed your life and there is a light that is shining that everybody can see then Jesus said if the light is there if the gospel has made a mark an impression upon your life let the light so shine how is he going to so shine that day that this, that is the people around you may see and behold your good works not evil works not a uh, carnal works not a uh, not satanic demonic works and uh, not even human works that they may see your good works produce my grace and then they will glorify your father who is in heaven we come back to first peter chapter 2 in first peter chapter 2 peter said he was telling them that that so that the people will behold their good works and then they will glorify god in the day of visitation which kind of day is that he's talking about when the day will when the lord will visit them the day the lord will visit those sinners and show them that they ought to be saved that day of visitation those people will say yes lord i'm going to accept because i've seen one of your children he lived the light out and the life he lived has really challenged me i want to live like that myself and then they glorify god on your behalf or if they don't do that and give their lives to the lord on the final day the day of judgment and the day of reckoning god would have given them undeniable proof and evidence that evidence that god is real that the gospel is true that salvation is real that there were people that got that salvation and then when they are condemned to hell because of their sin they will glorify god they will justify god that god is real that god is truth and that his judgment is right and righteous because they have been given undeniable proof but they didn't accept the word that the lord gave unto them i come to point number two and it talks about our subjection and submission to the government our subjection and submission to the government i'm reading now from verse 13 it says submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the lord's sake whether it be to the king as supreme or to the governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evil doers and for the praise of them that do well here we now strike at something very very important and essential and it will appear that many people who are called by the name christian they do not understand this and they do not show that they really belong to the lord in the places where they are to, to make you understand it is god that instituted authority and as you look at the whole of society you'll find that there is authority first start in the home there's authority in the home there is a father that is the head of the home that you control everything that is going on there and god says when those children are born they are born into an environment of authority there is somebody that will say no to something they wanted to do there's somebody that will say yes that's all right you can go ahead and do that and they ought to understand in the home there is authority immediately they come out of the home they are afraid not to go to school as they get to school they see that god is a god of law and orderliness when they get to the school they see there's a teacher in charge of every class and that a teacher when he stands you see it that teacher when he speaks you obey they learn that in that little classroom there is authority and it's the appointment of god and then they understand when they look at the whole school there's a principal there and that is the one that directs everything that controls everything and all those children learning authority from the home they are supposed to learn authority right there in the school 
And then they come out of school and they begin to work. And what do they see? They see there's a manager there. There's an employer there. And there is a director there. And again, they see that they cannot come into the place of work when they wanted. And they cannot leave just when they wanted. There is law and order in society. They come out of that. And then as they are going on the road, they see a policeman that uh, says, uh, please stop. Let the other vehicle pass. That means that there are other people that are using the road with you. And you cannot just do anything that you want there is a control there and then if uh, they do not obey that control you know what happens the government will show the power of its authority and eventually if they do anything that is criminal they are taken to the prison to go and learn a lesson they should have learned i'm telling you that god has instituted authority and now peter was talking to these uh, believers he was telling them that you must recognize authority you will not say because you are a foreigner here on earth that you will not obey the laws of the nation in which you are living because even a stranger in a particular country still has to be law abiding because that country the government of that country will not allow anybody just to misbehave and do whatever he wants to do there is control there is law and order that's why it says in verse 13 submit yourselves to every ordinance of man why are you doing that for the lord's sake if you do not do that, it means that you are dishonoring the Lord who instituted authority in the world. And then it says, uh, to every ordinance of man, whether it be to the king and supreme. There is uh, somebody there who is the king and supreme. Then there is a state unto the governors as unto them that are sent by God for the punishment of evil doers and then for the praise of them that do well. And that's the lesson that we're learning. And we need to learn it fast. And we need to show by the life that we live that we are learning that lesson. And we're submissive to authority. And it means that we're not among the people that riot. We're not among the people that rebel against authority. We're not uh, among the people that just want to have our own way. Once there is a king, there is a leader, there is a ruler, we're supposed to be obedient. In Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. I'm reading there from verse chapter 13, verse 1. Let every soul be subject to the higher powers. It says that wherever you are, there are some people above you. And they are the higher powers. And they have office and they have the, the authority that have been given to them. Either because of democracy or because, uh, you know, they came in one way or the other. Let every soul be subject to the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. And the powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. You see that if you go to your place of work or in society you do something against the law of the nation and you are thinking it's because i'm a christian i'm above the law i'm above rule and regulation it says if you disobey and you rebel against the law of the land you resist to your own damnation for the rulers are not a terror to good works in verse 3 but uh, to the evil will thou then not be afraid of the power and uh, do that which is good and thou shalt have Praise of the same, for he is a minister of God for thee to, uh, to thee for good. For if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. If you do that which is evil, be afraid. Because there is punishment that is going to come as a result of the evil that is done. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that, do, that doeth evil. Wherefore, uh, ye must need needs be subject not only for us but for conscience sake a believer ought to have conscience and when you do something the spirit of god is grieved you will know that in your heart except you have hardened yourself to the point that the spirit of god is saying that's not right you shouldn't do that you must be law abiding be a real christian show that you are really born again show that christ is living in you uh, give unto caesar what belongs to caesar and unto god what belongs to god make sure that uh, you recognize authority in society but if you're hardening your heart then the condemnation will be there and the spirit of god might just leave you uh, to continue your own way but that's the way of perdition in matthew chapter 22 matthew chapter 22 reading from verse 17 
tell us therefore what secrets thou they were asking questions from the lord jesus christ they said is it lawful to give tribute pay tax unto caesar or not but jesus perceived their wickedness and said why tempt ye me ye hypocrites show me uh, the tribute money and they brought unto him a penny and he said unto them whose image and superscription is this and they say unto him caesar's then he said unto them render unto caesar render therefore unto caesar the things that which are caesar's and unto god the things that are gods which means then we as children of god we will render down to the the authority in society what belongs to them our children when they go to school we ought to instruct them although you are born again make sure that when you get to school respect your teachers honor your principal and even if those principals and teachers are not born again give them the honor that their office demands if the other students are uh, wanting to riot or they are playing pranks or they are a kind of uh, making caricature of their of their teachers and making fun of their principals you don't do that because you are a real child of god because you are born again and because you must show that you are living the life that a believer ought to live otherwise if you do like all the other students and you you riot with them you do evil with them you you conspire with them against your teachers and principals you'll be showing that you do not know the lord and when you get into trouble the lord will not deliver you because the trouble came out of rebellion and a uh, rebellion against authority and disobedience against the word of god in romans chapter 12 verse 10 Romans chapter 12, reading from verse 10, be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. And we're coming now to the area where it says you love the brotherhood as well. First Peter chapter 2. In First Peter chapter 2, reading there from verse 15 now, it says in verse 15, for so it's the will of God that with well doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. There may be foolish men, there may be untaught, ignorant men that will accuse you. What do they accuse you of? They say you are insubordinate. They say you don't respect anybody. They say since you said you are born again, you don't recognize anybody anymore. You will prove them wrong. You will silence your critics by the kind of life that you live. That it is the will of God. That with well-doing, not with argument, not by rioting. It is with well-doing you will put to silence the ignorance of foolish men he says in verse 16 as free and not using your freedom your liberty as a cloak of maliciousness but as a servants of god you will not say i am free well if you are free christ has set you free to do right not to do evil you were doing evil before you came to christ at that time you were not uh, you were not free you were sinning before you came to christ at that time you were not free you were destroying your life or the things you were smoking and drinking before you came to christ at that time you are not free if you are now free show that you are free to be righteous you are free to do right you are free to be pure you are free to do good we are not free to do evil we are free to do that which is right and then what do we do in verse 17 honor all men love the brotherhood fear god honor the king he says that you want you relate to all men you will love them you will honor them you respect them in honor you prefer one another you don't look down other people you don't uh, do anything that will hurt other people honor all men in fact the lord has given us uh, a way whereby we ought to know am i honoring all men or am i not honoring the men the women uh, the people that i meet look at matthew chapter 7 reading there from verse 12 Matthew chapter 7, reading from verse 12, Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do unto you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. That's how to honor all men. You see somebody junior to you, and then you say, How do I act to him so that I can honor him? Very simple. What you want him to do unto you, do unto him. You see, you are a man, a uh, very strong and very powerful, and the other fellow is a woman. And uh, you say, what am I to do to honor her? Very simple. As you want her to do unto you, do so unto them. You are a student, and you are in the 
higher class and the other students in a very low class and the bible says honor all how are you to honor that junior student just ask yourself if i were a junior student and he were the senior what would i want him to do unto me as you want others to do unto you so do unto them and uh, as you relate together in the church how do we honor one another uh, from worker to worker from worker to member from member to member from the leaders to the membership of the church how do we honor one another whatsoever things therefore you want that other men should do unto you do ye even so to them because this actually is a summary of all the law and all the prophets we'll come back now to first peter chapter 2 and we're reading there in verse 17 honor all men without exception some of them are good some of them are bad some of them are saved and some of them are not saved some of them are nice and some of them are unkind some of them are charitable some of them are unloving some of them are helpful and some of them they hinder but whoever they are this is the commandment of the lord honor them honor them leave the result uh, you know whatever they are doing leave that in the hands of the lord honor all men and then it says love the brotherhood those who are the children of god you will love them and it is not just a lip service in, in fact jesus said in john chapter 13 in john chapter 13 reading from verse 34 and 35 a new commandment i give unto you that ye love one another as i have loved you stop there for a moment as i have loved you when you think about your christian in fact this is what god is going to measure in our lives and the, the evidence that we're studying the bible i said earlier there are people that come to study the bible and you will not see the bible rubbing off on them you'll not see any influence of that bible on them you'll not see any kind of impact of that bible on them and this is one of the tests and this is one of the evidences that jesus christ said a new commandment i give unto you that you love one another as i have loved you again if you have difficulty how do i love another person very simple you want people to love you don't you yes and how do you want them to love you you have some things to expect them to do towards you and when they do those things to so smile you're very happy you say what a wonderful day today they are showing love to me do that to other people all things you would that men should do unto you do ye even so unto them he said because by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye have love one to another so peter tells us number one honor all men number two uh, love the brotherhood number three fear god fear god in all the things that you do you are fearing god how do you fear god you are fearing god in the sense that you honor him you respect him and you're obedient to the word that he has reaching down he has given unto us and you know that if you don't fear him that judgment will come eventually and then he tells us honor the king he comes back to the subject again there is authority and therefore it says respect authority accept authority honor the king let's move on now to point number three in point number three we're talking about the servant service as unto god the servant service as unto god now come to first peter chapter 2 reading there from verse 18 servants be subject to your masters with all fear not only to the good and gentle but to the forward stop there for a moment here is again the test of our christian life and the test of a real christian faith and the way you will see christians today especially in their places of work and uh, when the people when the people at the place of work are discussing together unbelievers and believers sometimes you don't see any difference at all the unbelievers are disrespectful to the uh, to the boss to the master in their places of work and the so-called believers the same thing and uh, we used to see the difference between believers coming to this church and believers going to other churches and the masters and the employers in those places they used to be able to mark us out because we will not take part in anything that is fraudulent will not take part in anything that is destructive will not take part in anything that is uh, going to bring down that place of work will not take part in anything that is going to be injurious to anyone any man employer employee anyone there in the past 
But now as you look at the people in those places of work, whether they are deeper life or in any other church, they appear to be the same. Whether they are deeper life or they are Muslims, they appear the same when it concerns the way they behave in the place of whether it is deeper life or pagans that don't go to any church there, uh, to any church, and in those places of work, attitude the same. Manner of life, the same. At the ethics of the work, the same. As the other people loiter, they loiter. As the other people waste time, they waste time. As the other people be selling something on the side and leave the work they ought to be doing and then be making money on the side. So the uh, so-called Christians are doing the same. As the people are gossiping about their boss, so the people who say they are Christians, they are doing the same. As the other people are planning out a riot, how to do evil to the employers, to the management, so the people who say they are Christians, they are doing the same. The Bible says it should not be so. In verse 18, it tells us very clearly servants. That means employees, the people that are working in those places of employment, be subject, be submissive to your masters. And then it qualifies it how we are to be subject, how we are to be submissive with all fear. Here is the dividing line where you know a Christian indeed. And then you know, just a formal churchgoer. The one that doesn't have the impact of the word of God in his heart or life. When you have the impact of the word of God, you're very careful. You want to be obedient to the word of God. And you know, sometimes it's very, very painful that uh, the, uh, those who are in our church, and God has blessed them, they established a school. God has blessed them, they established a particular factory. Or God has blessed them, it's an agreed farm they have established, and they look for helping hands, they look for employees that will work with them. And they say, it's going to be wonderful. I'm going to create jobs for members of our church. And then they get to that district and get to that district. And they get members of the church. And then you are surprised. Uh, these people who are employers, members of our church, they begin to complain that they never saw trouble before when they had people of other denominations. And even when some Muslims came to work under them, those people were submissive and they did their work. But when they got our members and our members started working with them, it appears that the lives of these, our members, and the bad things they do in that place of work even destroyed the loyalty of the people that were there before them and they began to wonder where is the evidence of all the things we're learning in the church and then uh, even if that uh, person will confront the fellow and say come are we not members of the same church what are you doing like this you're even influencing the other workers to do evil in this place and uh, we're not making progress anymore i'm losing a lot and the fellow will say what is that i'm a child of god uh, it's uh, i'm responsible to god if you think i'm doing it my conscience does not condemn me and then you understand that these people although they are coming to church they do not have the impact of the gospel upon their lives servants if you happen to be a child of God, if you really know the Lord and love the Lord, it says, be subject to your masters with all fear. You honor him, you respect him, you fear him. And that's what the Bible says, not only to the good and gentle. There are some people that will tell us now, it's because, uh, you know, my boss himself, my master himself, he is not uh, doing as I expected. He's not following what they are teaching us in the church. Therefore, that's why I'm rude to him. That's why I'm rude to her. You don't have any right to do that. It says, even if they are not gentle and good, even if they are forward, the same thing we need to tell our children. Our children go to school, and then when the teacher comes, who is not a member of Deeper Life, those uh, children, they pay attention, they do their homework. When a teacher who is a Deeper Life uh, member, when he comes to the class, then they will be playing some pranks. They will not be serious. They will be disturbing in the class, and they will be influencing other children to disrespect that teacher. What's the common sense in that? How does that show that we really know the word of God? That we're obedient to the strangers. We are respectful to the strangers. And when people who are in the same church with us, uh, partaking of the same bread of life with us, when they come, then we're disrespectful to them. All that should not be so. It is an evidence that we do not really know the Lord. That's why it says, servants, be subject to your masters with all fear. Not only to the good and gentle, but also to the forward. Then it says in verse 19, for this is worthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief suffering wrongfully 
you do well and you suffer that doesn't matter you still keep on doing well and then in verse 24 what glory is it if when ye be buffeted when you are chastised when you are rebuked for your faults ye take it patiently uh, in fact, uh, today, even when people do wrong and you try to correct them in the very mildest way that you can, uh, they will still neglect the correction. But it says, when you do wrong and then you are rebuked and then you are corrected according to the word of God, here is the evidence will belong to the Lord that you are able to take that. You don't feel offended, you don't feel ruffled. After all, you've done wrong, you've made a mistake, and something has gone wrong. It's got to be corrected. If you take it, that's uh, the child of God. But it says, But if when you do well and suffer for it, you've done the best you can. Well, the best of intentions that you could put forth. And yet, you are misunderstood. It may be in the place of work. It may be uh, with her students in the school. Or it may be in an interaction between husband and wife. Between parents and children. You've done well. You've done right. And yet, you suffer for it. You take it patiently. This is acceptable in the sight of the Lord. You know, if you do that, those are the people that have the Lord always before them in the work that they are doing in Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, reading from verse 5, it says, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh. It's still the same word of God. It says, are you a servant? Are you an employee? Are you working somewhere? Be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling. That's the word of God. Do we have any respect for our employees today? Employers today? Do, do we fear them? Even when we come late and, you know, you are coming and he also is coming. And then he wants to challenge you that, uh, why is it you are just coming now? And then some of us might even be so bold because, uh, you know, the righteous is as bold as a lion. I have the Holy Ghost. Since I had the Holy Ghost in my life, I could challenge anybody. If they are going to take their work, let them take their work. And so when that employ employer says, are you coming at this time? Says, sir, am I the only one that is late? Have you been here before me? Are you not just coming to you? Are you challenging me like that? And then if they lose their job, they say, well, it doesn't matter. God will provide. God will not provide. Because you are rebellious, you are disobedient. And you are making the unbelievers outside to disrespect the gospel. They cannot see the power of the gospel in your life. You will relate with them with fear and trembling. In singleness of heart, as unto the Lord. Not with high service, as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ. Doing the will of God from the heart. With, uh, with good will, doing service as to the Lord and not unto men. That's what the Lord is teaching. And that's the way we ought to take the word of God. Let's come back now and see what the Lord is telling us and teaching us today. And what the Lord is expecting. That we will be under authority. As strangers and sojourners here on earth, dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, you abstain from fretly laws, which war against the soul, having your conversation, your manner of life, honest and winsome among the Gentiles, that whereas they may be speaking evil of you as evil doers, they will behold your good works, your Christ-like behavior, in which they will behold and glorify God in the day of visitation. But then it says, you'll submit yourselves to every ordinance of man to the, for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme, or unto governors, as unto them that are sent by him uh, for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise, for the commendation of them that do well. Because this is the will of God, that what well doing, you may put to silence the critics who are ignorant and they are foolish. It says, although you are free. Yet you are not using your freedom, your liberty, as a covering for maliciousness and for evil. But you are living as the servants of God. How are you living? You honor all men. You do unto them as you want them to do unto you. You love the brotherhood, the brethren. You fear God and you honor God. And you are obedient to the word of God and you honor the king. And if you are a servant, if you are an empl employee, you are subject and submissive to employers. With all fear, not only to those who are good and sanctified, but even to those who are sinful and forward because this is thankworthy if because of conscience toward God you even endure grief suffering wrongfully when you have to 
Because what glory is it if when you are buffeted and chastised and rebuked for your faults, you will take it patiently. But if, as a child of God, living according to the word of the Lord, when you do right, when you do well, they still blame you and make a mistake and you suffer for it, you take it patiently. That, in the sight of God, is acceptable. It takes grace to obey what we have learned today. And you rise up now, you ask the Lord to give you that grace, so that by the grace of God, you will not be living as if you don't understand authority, you don't understand uh, order and law in the society and in the church and in the home and in the school. Rise up and tell the Lord, examine yourself. How have you been living? Have you been so incorrigible and so rebellious? Have you been living your life as if you are not really a child of God? Can the people in your place of work, can they see that you are a real child of God? The people in your place of work, can they really see that you honor them, you respect them, you do what is right? You are walking with the fear of God in your heart. You are walking with the understanding that as a child of God, you ought to live right, you ought to behave well. Are you submissive to authority? Or are you not an authority by yourself, authority to yourself? That you're like living in the time of the judges when there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Talk to the Lord. The evidence that you belong to the Lord is that you're obedient to the word of God. You're obedient to authority. You're submissive to authority.